Hi everyone, for today's UX showcase, I wanted to share some of the work that we've been doing on the release stage around feature flags. Um, and I'm really excited to share it with you because it was the trial of a lot of different attributes coming together and creating this really great vision um, and way for our team to move forward with this area. To clarify a few things, feature flags is inside of the release section. And I know a lot of us are used to hearing me talk about packages and containers and dependency properties. I've been covering the release stage as there has been some uh, reorganization as well as realignment of priorities and stuff like that. So I was here trying to help um, cover the design needs for the release stage during this transition, um, as well as kind of trying to make sure we're moving things forward. Today I wanted to talk about the feature flags work that we did. And so to kick off, I kind of want to share the overall view of the work we wanted to do. There was a lot of change in priority and there was a lot of unknowns as we were first getting started and the team came together. And so we decided to focus our efforts around feature flags. The hypothesis was by creating a single source of truth for feature flags, users would be able to easily find, investigate, and act on feature flags inside of the GitLab product. We had heard from a lot of users in a lot of different cases where they weren't able to fully utilize the different parts of feature flags. They were wondering if there were parts that were missing. Um, and a classic workaround that we had to look for is they were creating issues to manage their feature flag anyway. So we know that there was a need, which is a really exciting way to start a project. We first started off by diving into what work we had around feature flags to look at. There were quite a few bugs that had been reported, and there were features that had been requested that just kind of sat in the backlog by themselves. We brought them all together and kind of came up with a few different priorities that we saw. They divided into two different areas, which you'll notice through the rest of the conversation is kind of how we talked about the work. The first is the list view. This is the view where you get to see all of the feature flags. Looking at the current view, it had a bit of a buggy layout. Um, we were using tables, which means they were kind of inflexible, and then we had some content that was really short, other content that was really long, and so things would overlap with each other, or you would end up with kind of that hill UI that was several lines tall, things that didn't quite feel up to the caliber that we like to see in the GitLab. We also heard reports that the actions in the list viewer is a little chaotic, and um, again, the long text limited horizontal space was becoming an issue. The other half of the work that we looked at was in a detailed view. Starting off, we really didn't have a detailed view for feature flags. And for something that had such an impact on users, it felt really strange, both to me and to users. There was no place they could just look at what's going on with this feature flag. The interface that we offer is just an edit view. So some users felt uncomfortable being there if they weren't going to change the feature flag. The interface had some limited data. The overall content hierarchy and structure was lacking some um, of what they needed and able to really quickly digest the information. And some of the controls that they really expected to have just felt missing. Taking a look at it, all the work we wanted to do around feature flag, and then bringing into account the fact that as a designer, I'm only um, supporting the release stage at half time, I wanted to best utilize my time to make sure that we were utilizing efficiency and getting results, living the GitLab way. For Arit, the product manager and the release team, the Think Big idea was kind of new, especially for the designer. They were used to working in a way where iteration happened and then designs were reactive. We found the iteration and we had to create a design for it for this milestone so they can work on it in the next milestone. And we heard when we were talking about the other designers that were involved that sometimes it's hard to keep up and they felt like they were always just trying to fill in the next milestone instead of thinking about things from a strategic vantage. So with limited time on my part, knowing that we were going to bring someone on board soon, we wanted to make the best use of our time and run this experiment together. In case you're curious about what Think Big is and what I mean by that, we're actually opening up an MR to have this exact conversation. But the focus is that instead of designers reacting to iterations that are defined, we're trying to move design into the vision holders for the team and for the strategy or the category. And then once everyone has a unified vision, work together to break it down in a way that makes sense. We went through the design process, um, lots of conversations with engineering and with some customers that were really involved in the conversation. And we came up with two different designs. The first one was a list view. We kind of tailored it down. We used progressive disclosure in some areas and kind of cleaned it up with the data that users had told us was most important to them. The other thing we looked at was the detail view. And I'm hoping for a lot of us, this looks somewhat familiar. We were exploring the idea of creating feature flags of an issue type, meaning that it would have all of the same controls and mechanisms and organizational tools that we have for issues. We could assign it to a milestone, give it a due date, add labels, things like that. Participants and users could put their 
feature flag work into their milestones that they were planning. And it felt like a lot of the things user, users were asking for were right in that vein, so the alignment seemed really good. We, of course, went through solution validation. This was kind of the next milestone. For this, we did moderated testing, focusing on determining if participants could grok the interface itself, find the newly introduced data and data architecture useful, and determine if the issue type aligned with their workflow. What we did for the actual solution validation during the moderated testing is we asked users to, um, first, we presented them with a problem. We need you to investigate this feature flag and determine the next step. We asked them, what do you expect your process to be around here? And we kind of gathered their expectation. Next, using the prototype, we asked them to find a specific feature flag, understand and kind of describe what they were seeing in terms of what's going on with that feature flag and determine the next step. The last part of the solution validation was focused on individual pieces of the UI. So we walked from the top to the bottom. What does this UI moment mean? What does this UI moment mean? Really go through the effort of trying to understand what users were seeing and what it meant to them validate that the data we were trying to present was being received. Solution, val solution validation results, they're always really exciting. We had a lot of wins. Um, every participant was able to complete the task. So they were able to find the feature flag, they were able to understand the data that was being shown, stuff like that. We, Because we asked them ahead of time, what do you expect you would do in order to solve this problem? We were able to see that the UI and the flow that we put together matched what they were expecting. They expected to find it in a list. They expected rollout information to be presented, et cetera. The information shown was really clear. This feels really nice because we were using a lot of standard GitLab patterns and users were able to very quickly say, yes, this is what this is. Yes, this is what this is. And they felt confident in what they were saying. We added a history and discussion section, similar to what we see at the bottom of issues. Users really loved that. They wanted, and were excited by the idea that not only could they see the rollout pattern now, but they could see when it started. And if there's a bug in production, they can see like the feature flag started in production two weeks ago when we started having bugs two weeks ago. This lined up for them a lot. One thing that a lot of the users said is this now feels like GitLab, which is always a really powerful thing because we do have a high standard for our design and the way it should feel and look especially when we're trying to enable trust. Getting them to react that way was really powerful. Some things we did learn, unfortunately, feature flags with an issue type didn't quite resonate with our users. They found it kind of confusing at times. And when they did understand it and were able to kind of walk me through it, what we discovered is for a lot of organizations, the individuals and team members that were in the backlog, engineers and product designers, weren't really directly impacting feature flags when compared to an SRE whose job it is is to make sure rolling out goes effectively. And so combining the two of them didn't quite work for them. This was doubled down on the controls became really confusing. So if I close the issue for the feature flag, does it turn off the feature flag? Things like that just didn't quite line up. And when we tried to explore a little further with the users, they couldn't really come up with an answer that made sense to them. And then the last thing we learned is as we talked to a lot of different people, the different needs of different org sizes were completely different. Small, scrappy startups had one person, the engineer, managing a feature flag from start to finish. And so it kind of made more sense that it wasn't an issue. Large organizations, there's whole other teams that handle this. And so putting them together didn't quite work for them. They did like, however, that they were all connected. So what we walked away from, we made some edits to the list view and the detail view. We took a lot of the learnings that were positive and got really good feedback from the users and we put them into the design. We know and have a lot of confidence that things tested well, that people were feeling really excited. And so we have a lot of work that we could work on. One of the advantages is because we were thinking bigger and trying to expand the view of what we were looking at to create that vision, even though the issue type part of the conversation wasn't quite what we thought, what we were looking for, a lot of what we were doing and showing to our users resonated. It tested very well and they liked the improvement. So even though the core of it wasn't quite what we wanted, we did see a lot of great stuff. The next step, of course, is after solution validation, you've got your design and it's pretty and users love it, is passing it off to your engineers. There was a very large hesitancy in this new release group that we were going back to a waterfall, that we had done this really big design and then just kind of handed it off to them and now they expected to just build everything. And that goes against our values of iteration, how focused we are in MVC, this just didn't feel right to them and understandable. So what we did is I asked them for a little bit of trust. It worked out really well. And I said, we're going to break it down together. It's going to make a lot of sense. And it's going to feel independent and individual. And I hope you like it. What we ended up doing was really demonstrating that think big, work small model. 
So based on the testing, based on the exploration, all the design work we did, we were able to create 13 unique and independent issues. Some of the issues were really simple. This issue is devoted to updating the button to the brand new styling that we should be using, making that primary button blue instead of green. Some of them were a lot larger, like adding the markdown description and edit state for the issues. This is a lot of uh, interconnected parts and will probably have to be broken down a little bit further, but they're actionable now for engineering. There's also from the research, this refinement area where we know we're gonna to have to investigate further. The history and discussion section, being able to see the history of the feature flag and add comments, we know already that there's gonna be a need for a technical investigation. We're gonna to have to explore whether we can just copy and paste what's already there into the feature flag. What happens if I get tagged in it? Does it also make a new to-do? How do we handle that? So we know we're gonna to have to have those conversations, but when we have that unified vision, it's easy for engineers to take the lead in those conversations and come forward with ideas. Instead of kind of asking designers and product managers to define a lot of things for them, it makes it a lot more of a collaborative experience. And this is the same thing with the expanding the filters and sorting capabilities and enhancing the strategy. We know we're gonna to have to put a little more work in there. The other thing that we get to add with this think big model is we now know some more areas we need to explore. We found some things that we know kind of work and we should do more investigation on it. The big one that's kind of obvious is the connection between issues and feature flag. Users saw that there was some need for them to be closely interacting, but the fact that one was exactly the other didn't work. So we need to put in more time into that. That's my spiel for today. It was a really fun exercise, especially considering that I was at half time. So there was a lot of efficiency in delivering and setting expectations. It was really wonderful to work with the release team, Ori and Nicole, and absolutely everybody was wonderful to work with. Lots of great communication. A lot of you on the release team took a chance and you trusted me and I hope that you are very excited with the outcome um, as some of the engineers happened. That's it for my presentation. So thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, Ian. I've seen how Feature Flag has evolved as a capability. So it's super exciting to see the next steps and how we can make it a first class capability with GitLab. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and it looks like we have a couple of questions in the agenda. Holly, would you like to, to voice your first comment? Sure, it's just kind of an FYI. We have a lot of really interesting and exciting things happening surrounding the topic of issue types right now. So there are a couple of issues related to that. Um, and I think, Hayana, you are also working with Amelia on yet another type. So uh, we are all in coordinating our issue types conversation so that we can ensure that we're in alignment. But if you want to dig a little deeper into that, there's some helpful links. Awesome, thank you. And I. Mike L, I think it's Mike Long. Is that you, Mike? Next oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, have, we have more than one Mike L, don't we? Um, that, was, that was great, Ian. I love the feature flag work. And um, I noticed in the design issue, um, under intended users, we list basically every persona. <laughs> and I'm wondering if, if there was, when you were designing, if you had a primary kind of roller persona in mind when you envisioned someone using this. For sure. Um, you bring up a great point. Feature flag could possibly be used by a lot of users and wanted to identify that when we were describing it. The users that we focused on, there were two. The main one was the engineers, and these are generally the individuals who are creating the feature flags, adding it to the code, and, and managing it, at least in the beginning. For smaller organizations, that carried through all the way into rollout. For larger organizations, we still focused on the engineer, but there was this other persona, the SRE, who was basically the person on the team who was responsible for rolling out things effectively, making sure production is good. Those are the individuals that, for example, when there's an incident on production that there's a problem, they would likely need to quickly find a feature flag and turn it off to stop whatever that problem is. And so they have a very different need and set of things they need to do, very action-oriented, versus engineers, which is very management-oriented, making sure the feature is behind the feature flag and working and testing and all those things. Well, yeah, both of those roles um, kind of have a high stake in how well they, how easily they can find the feature flag, right? That's awesome. And then um, I had the next question. Uh, what is our path to dog food? This at GitLab. That is a great question. We have um, internally on the GitLab project, we don't currently use our feature flag offering, but the fulfillment team is starting to use it. And that was actually really great because um, we're starting to get there with package, but this was the first chance that I could do solution validation with dog fooding and hearing about what our engineers and what people who work on fulfillment actually have as an experience using GitLab to manage the feature flags of GitLab while talking about 
Beach of Flags in GitLab. It was a really quite circular, fun experience. Cool, thank you. Daniel, yeah. I got the uh, next point. Uh, I can read this one out loud, even though I'm not sure it's really a question, but I would love to learn more about what was your process for slicing the project into the build, refine, export tasks, especially how you applied this to your Figma files in your design documentation and how you made this clear to the developers in the project. That's a really good question. Um, this process was a very collaborative one. So I spent some same time with engineers of the different parts of the release team saying, here's where we want to go. How would you break it up if you had a magic wand and could just say, this is how we're going to do it? We started off with those conversations. I was able to take notes of these two pieces are connected, this is isolated, and kind of separate out the pieces. And then from there, this is a less elegant thing, but it seems to be really effective for me as I kind of take the current state and figure out what is the smallest change I can make to the current state to get me into where I want to go, which is that vision. And so for this example, I mentioned earlier, changing the button from the green to the new blue primary, that's the first issue because it's just the first easiest thing to get us where we want to go. And basically, once I have that first one, then you look at the same thing and be like, okay, when I'm looking at the second screen, what's the smallest change I can make to get here? And it's a really cool exercise. It sounds kind of laborious, but what you actually end up doing is validating all of your design choices, especially when you're thinking a bit bigger, saying it's actually really important to add this tab to the top of the page by itself because it makes the content hierarchy so much easier to digest instead of here's absolutely everything I design. It all works and it tested well, so just trust me. It's a very different kind of conversation. For sure, thanks for the answer. Austin, I think you have the next question. Yeah, so I was trying to understand how you took that vision and broke it down with your engineering team. I saw that you closed your design issue for the vision. Did you like promote that vision into an epic and then broke down those 13 issues and tied them back up to that epic? I've definitely run into this problem too of like trying to keep the vision there, but then also trying to delineate all the issues. But then what ends up happening is that one issue to just like do the buttons and becomes like, seven implementation issues. And now we've got epics and epics with issues related to other issues. So I was curious what you ended up doing. I will be totally honest with you, Austin. I haven't gotten there yet. This is fresh out of the oven design work. I have it broken down. My team is very excited about how we're going to break it down. And now I get to create all these issues. My plan around that, I can tell you, is we closed the design issue because the design issue was dedicated to spending time creating a vision for future flags, which that work is completed. Solution validation is also in that epic, that's completed. The next step is that epic, I'm gonna refine it to map our full vision and put that really pretty mock-up right at the top of, here's where we wanna go. Then what I'm planning on is creating two sub epics. One is for that list view that we talked about, one is for the detail view, and then just creating one of those issues one by one. I'm gonna use the lean feature proposal because it's the shortest, I'll be honest. Um, and it's also the easiest one to like get started with and create the issue. Here's the current state. Here's what we're going to change. Here's why it's relevant. I like to connect user research into those issues as well. So here's the insight that said users really like this and why we need to prioritize it as a thing. Um, and then basically kind of go through until we're there. Um, the only exception is every once in a while that issue that I know is going to be broken down. I will usually include, this is how I think we should break it down but I am 100% not the technical expert here. So that is up to you. This is just my thought. Does that answer your question, Austin? Definitely. And it aligns like 100% with how I would expect it to be. So even better. And great usage of leaning into using GitLab to help break down that work. Even if you don't know the best answer, you just help move it forward. And that's where you can lie on the rest of your team to help you refine it. Nadia, you have a uh, next question. Uh, I think my question was already answered by the previous two answers, so I'm good. Thanks, Ian. It's great. Awesome. And then last questions by Nick before we can wrap up. 
Yeah, I just want to say this is this has been a, a great presentation. Really appreciate it. And this like really feels like design for me. So uh, like it's sort of the design and design thinking approach that I'm really uh, familiar with. So it's great to see this uh, in GitLab and this being sort of balanced in an all remote environment. And I was just wondering um, when I've done this stuff synchronously, um, typically we've driven engagement for engineers by getting everyone in, together in a workshop, getting people sort of pumped up and getting getting like everyone sort of uh, engaged that way. Have you got any tips for how you can engage uh, engineers and other team members um, in this sort of async con context or in this sort of uh, remote context? That's an excellent question. Um, my biggest tip is get engineers involved earlier. Um, so when you're doing that initial stage of sketching up wireframes, there's zero harm in just pinging a couple of the engineers on your team and saying, this is the concept I want to build towards. We've clearly not even started the official design here, but what do you think? And going through and touching base with them on the regular means that when it's time to break up that thing and get them more involved, they're already aware of all the context of the things you're talking about. So you remove the need for like, here's 20 minute presentation of what my design is, and then five minutes, let's quickly figure out the next step. Instead, those few moments where you are synchronous, it is purely devoted to, you know the plan, you know where we wanna go, how do you wanna build it? Because ultimately you're the ones building it. So this is the most important step for you to determine your workload, how you wanna work, those kinds of questions. Kind of positioning it that way has really enabled engineers to feel empowered to jump in. Especially, I mentioned the history section. This is the perfect example of, it seems like it should be easy because we have it everywhere, but it actually technically it's very difficult. So we should just assume that's gonna be hard. And then I can take that back and just say, okay, well, here's the issue dedicated to that. I can warn us that this is gonna be broken up and then pass it on to you, just like normal planning breakdown flow that people are used to. Wonderful, love it. I think this is a great example of our value of transparency. Thank you. I see a lot of head shaking. So <laughs> thank you so much, Ian. Thank you.